now everybody will have to get click a thing that says it's okay to record. So welcome, hi YouTube, uh, to uh, to our mm -hmm. our our newest and strangest math career day uh, in history, uh, spring 2020, um, well, uh, which is being held virtually. Uh, thanks thanks to the uh, the the pandemic and the quarantine. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's just have so our here here's our list of uh, of uh, panelists. So why don't, why, don't I, why don't each of you introduce yourselves and uh, and talk about. Uh, well, actually, why don't you, each, of, each of you introduce yourself. So, Erin, go ahead. Hi, so I graduated from San Jose State back in 08. I focus on computational and applied mathematics, which I find is uh, widely desired by a lot of tech companies, which is the industry that I went into with high tech. So I do a lot of uh, numerical modeling and different regression analysis. And today was my first day at Salesforce, which I have been trying to get into for years. So today was a, an all-time uh, <laughs> goal achievement. All right. Well, congratulations. Um, and Sid yes. is not Sid is not here yet. I don't think. Um, okay, uh, Jeff, uh, go ahead. Introduce yourself, please, and uh, wh where you are and what, what you uh, do for a living. Sure. Um, so I'll start with school. Um, I um, majored in statistics. And I graduated from an undergrad degree at San Jose State in 2015. And then I came back for more. So I graduated uh, from this, uh, the grad program in statistics in 2018. And then uh, somewhere along the line, I interned for um, Mercer. Uh, and then now I'm working as an actuarial analyst at uh, a state insurance company uh, uh, under workers comp. It's called, it's not state farm, it's state fund. Uh, state Compensation Insurance Fund. Yeah, I hope I got all your attributions right. I just copied them from LinkedIn. Oh, no, no. The reason I say, I say that is because every time I tell people where I work, they're like, you work at State Farm? I'm like, no. I said State Fund. <laughs> right, right. State <laughs> Farm is over there somewhere, not where you are. Exactly. Yeah. So. Okay, Amit? Hey, everyone. Amit Riker, and I graduated in 2006. Um, Aaron and I had crossed paths uh, back then. We were both involved with Math Club as well. And so, yes, we were. <laughs> and I went on to, so I got my bachelor, a BA, uh, bachelor's in mathematics, and then went on to get a master's in public administration. And I think of all the folks on the panel, I'm the least uh, directly tied into math field. Uh, I, I, was working at uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, as a contracting officer, but then since then have uh, uh, launched my own uh, leadership coaching, executive coaching <laughs> business, and have been doing stuff in that work. And uh, as we dig in, I can make the ties as to how, how math has played into that. Okay, cool. And now let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here because our, our, our uh, last panelist just showed up. Hi, Sid. Hi, I was here the whole time, but oh, I think my yeah. name came up wrong. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there. Yeah, uh, yeah. My my kid sort of tried to tried to to bargain just now. Uh, so um, so uh, can you introduce yourself? Introduce yourself and uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Sid, and uh, I passed out from San Jose State in 2008. Uh, I went to UCLA, and then I got a master's uh, in UCLA, and now. Um, and I think starting 2012, I have been working at Google. And uh, I'm a software engineer there. And uh, we, uh, the kind of things we do is, I'm in, I'm in ads quality, by the way. So um, given uh, a web page and a request uh, and a bunch of advertisers wanting to place an ad, uh, we have to figure out which ad is uh, the best ad, the best in quotes ad to place on the web page. So we have to do a lot of uh, mo uh, machine learning modeling and analysis and uh, statistical analysis and stuff like that. Great. So, yeah. That's about and, uh, and our last guest, uh, who, whom I had uh, belatedly, sorry, Judy, uh, is uh, Judith Garcia uh, from, uh, from uh, the Career Center. So if you want us to say a word about yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Judy Garcia. I'm a career. I'm the career counselor for the College of Science, 
And um, I'm here because I want to find out what all of you have to say about a number of topics. I'm sure Tim will cover a lot of that, but I'm interested. Students are hitting, you know, obviously hitting us up now about internships and jobs, what's going to happen in the short term or long term, none of us really knows. But I think this is a great opportunity for all of you to let students know how to really prepare themselves and what employers look for and how they should just really posture themselves for opportunities um, going forward. Okay, great. And that's an excellent guide to uh, what I hope each of our speakers will uh, talk about in turn. All right. so. Uh, uh, so I think let's let's uh, stick with our original plan. So I, I'll have each of you uh, going by alphabetical order and last name uh, talk about sort of your story, uh, like how how your math degree. Uh, just say again what your math degree, math stats degree was, and how how it got you your first job, and sort of uh, what your current job is now, and how you use how you use your degree in your everyday work environment. Okay, so uh, first up is Aaron. So I got my degree in uh, computational and applied mathematics, and I knew that I didn't probably have the best patience for teaching, <laughs> so I went into the business set just for transparency reasons. So I started out at a small company just doing basic accounting. Accounting was really boring to me. Once you do high-level math, your brain is on a whole nother playing field, and so I went into more of a financial modeling and what I found out was there was a lack of some strong mathematical concepts that I didn't feel some of my peers um, experienced in school. So I actually, they, while they were, we were basically cross training one another, myself on statistics, regression analysis is huge in the market. You wouldn't believe on the people analytics that go into companies when they are deciding okay, we want to build our brand in Africa. How many people do we need with our budget, with our revenue goals? As we have these massive interrelated financial models. And a lot of the times I come in and the first thing I always have to remind people is make sure you state your disclaimers. Make sure you'll never know the truth, but make sure you at least understand the limitations of your models because your executive leadership is going to make decisions off of your models and be prepared to be questioned. So anyone that it has to um, defend a thesis, they are very well prepared to go in and interact with senior leadership. You will have that experience. I get daily questions on people always questioning either my approach, my data sources, my data integrity, which is really huge right now. And, and part of that is I think that there was an unprecedented demand for people that think along those lines, considering the growth of the technology impact. Mm -hmm. And we're not turning out enough students with that concept in mind as far as from an educational experience standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, <laughs> I didn't take internships seriously. So for those of you that don't think you need an internship, I guarantee you will, it's a lot easier to get your foot in the door. I had a lot of um, early challenges that I think I would not have experienced had I done an internship. So I want to make sure that's very clear. Do an internship, create those contacts. And one thing I do want to point out there, when you go into high tech, don't ever think there's any job security. Um, I have been a part of two massive layoffs. One of them was part of Symantec in 2016. And as you see now, Symantec is basically zilch. The industry is constantly changing. Uh, so what I made sure to do was cr always create positive connections. And a former manager at a former company found out I was part of the layoff. And she asked me back right away within a week. So I want to let you know how strong you should maintain your connections and be very karma centric whenever you're doing a professional change because you never know when that might be your saving grace. Very good. Uh, let's see. I would say the biggest project I've been on right now, I think um, if you're going to go into any kind of um, mathematical based aspect of a career, be very clear that you will need to pick up some sort of programming language. 
I had to pick up something that I never expected, which was SQL, because a lot of the financial systems that are out there, when you're doing an integration with another system, SQL is, is the core language that usually does the connection on the back end. And sometimes you will have help and sometimes you won't. And you're going to be like me staying up late at night and on the weekends trying to figure out how to code. Because you might not have the resources available to you. Um, is there anything specifically, uh, Professor, should you want me to uh, expand on? Um, how, how do you think your degree and your training sort of, uh, is reflected in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? I, I think that math is very scary all the way up to CFO level. And so the fact that when I was at San Jose State, all, all the mathematic professors really dumbed down the concept because you are literally teaching people that may not be comfortable with math or have enough experience. So the first thing is I do, I need to make sure I dumb it down so it's easy for them. The goal of what I'm trying to analyze here is X, Y, and Z. Just be considerate of A, B, C, we will never know. But keep that in mind that we have to constantly refresh our model because our environment of data is constantly changing. So rule of thumb is whenever we do a model, always do a trailing 12 months in time from the time you look at it. Make sure it always has a trailing 12 months current data regression analysis. The big thing that everyone is talking about right now in the industry, which I'm not sure if many people are familiar with, is they call it a cohort analysis. A cohort analysis is you're doing the same analysis, but you're, you're actually segmenting your population by the calendar year or the fiscal year. So you could, so businesses can say, well, we had this many customers that we brought on in 2018. Ever since they bought our product, how have we extended them in A, using our product or getting more revenue out of them? That is one of the biggest analyses right now, CEO level. It goes right into the board of directors uh, quarterly meetings. Okay. That, yeah, that would be something that I would definitely want San Jose State to put in their repertoire. That is huge right now. I mean, it's sort of in a, in a, in a, in a 30,000 foot level, it sounds more, like, if I may sort of summarize what you, what you said is like the way that your degree influences what you do now is that uh, you, you learn to communicate uh, math, sort of difficult stuff in a, in a very technical, mm -hmm. in, in an untechnical manner. And uh, yep. you learn to, you said many, many times, uh, you learn to sort of look at the base assumptions that, that you get in any sort of data set or any sort of model and, yeah. and take, stay aware of the limitations of that, uh, of that data set or model that are those two that things. Is correct. Too? Yes, okay, cool. I am constantly defending everything, justifications, any changes, why the changes. Cool. And, you know, of course, and of course, there was, as, as, uh, as uh, sort of, uh, as, as Judy will, will, will no doubt have picked up, there are a lot of non-math things in what you just said, such as mm -hmm. the, the industry is under constant upheaval, even when there's not like a pandemic, uh, you know, uh, the only constant is change, right? Right. Okay, so uh, next up is uh, Sid Congo. Let's see if I can pin, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi. Uh, so as I said, um, I passed out from SJSU uh, in 2008, and then I started uh, doing math in UCLA um, and uh, joined Google in 2012. And then let me talk about um, what I've been doing, how I got uh, the position at Google and uh, how my degree and background in math has helped me all along. Okay, so um, first off, uh, I would like to say that yes, uh, I wish I had spoken to Erin before and I had picked up some uh, coding before <laughs> before doing my math. Uh, so when I when I uh, decided to go into the industry and apply at that time, I had zero knowledge of any programming. I had done just one. Uh, one on one level Java course while at San Jose State, and that was it. Uh, I had absolutely no prior knowledge of uh, coding. And uh, thinking back, it would have been very good to have um, a language or two under my belt. Yeah. Um, having said that, uh, the other thing, the things that helped me actually was the sheer uh, confidence you get um, in dealing with anything analytical. Like when you do math uh, at whatever level, like uh, uh, college level onwards, uh, you just get 
very, very confident uh, to deal with any system which relies on uh, analysis of any sort. And I think that was a main, uh, uh, main factor in my mm, applying to various places, even though I didn't know the ABCs of that. For instance, um, I applied to financial institutions uh, for, in New York, and I applied to software engineering companies uh, uh, in LA and uh, Mountain View and elsewhere. And uh, I had really no experience in any of these fields at that time. Uh, but but uh, but they were they knew and I knew that we, uh, it's it's not a big deal to cash up if you have the background of uh, mathematics. So uh, for those of you who are doing math, I mean it is it's really uh, the the there is no limit. Uh, the, the opportunities are boundless. If you do math, uh, but back it up with the right skills of the moment, uh, at the moment, it seems like uh, programming and some basic uh, machine learning uh, is very, very useful uh, in the industry. Uh, so yeah, so that was my beginning. So then I joined Google and uh, I worked in a number of different capacities, but mostly around ads quality, uh, because that's the most, uh, at that time when I joined, I think it was one of the only or most uh, mathematically oriented uh, product areas in Google. Um, and uh, I've been very happy working there. And uh, uh, the good thing uh, in my job is that, uh, let me say the bad thing for it. The bad thing about my job is that um, I, I never feel like I'm doing something <laughs> tangibly good. Like I don't, because I don't meet many people who are very fond of ads. <laughs> and I, so, so, so that's, that's really the bad part. Um, and, uh, but uh, having said that, I, I do not deal, my work itself, locally speaking, does not deal with ads. It does deal with optimization, essentially. So I can, for the moment, um, deceive myself into thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not doing ads. I'm just doing something to make it better, things like that. So anyway, so that's that's the bad thing out of. Uh, but uh, the interesting part, uh, it's actually very interesting uh, in many other aspects. Uh, the the work I do day to day is almost very very reminiscent of a research uh, lab or a research, uh, like just doing your PhD or something, because um, you have very new problems uh, around the same problem space, but almost I would say uh, within month or a month or two months at the most, there is a turnaround and you are working on a fresh problem uh, with fresh challenges. Uh, so that is very, very exciting in my work. And the good thing about Google is that you get a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, freedom in choo choosing the kind of problems you want to work on and, uh, and the kind of things you want to deliver, let's put it that way. Uh, so yeah, so I've been able to choose uh, things which have a strong uh, mathematical uh, tilt to it. Uh, as well as something which is relevant to my team and to, to the uh, product area at large. Um, uh, and just, um, I keep coming back to it, but I think over the years, uh, I have felt most strongly about this, is that just the sheer confidence is, is the biggest thing that I've taken away from my background or my education in that. It's just that something comes up and I'm totally not, uh, I, I don't know the technology at all. I don't know the basic things about that, but I know that within a week I'll be able to come up to speed with whatever the problem demands. And I'll be able to think in a reasonably intelligent manner about this problem. And I think that is huge. And it's not just from your side. I think people around you are able to see that uh, right away and, and respect that. So I think that is, that is something, uh, worth cultivating and something which is really, really valuable in a math education. Even people I see uh, around me who are computer science, uh, uh, bachelors, masters, PhDs, uh, even them, they're not as comfortable in a change or a shifting paradigm as uh, some, some of us others are who have some grounding in math or uh, physics or things like that. So yeah, I know uh, it might be just my perception, but uh, personally speaking, I think it has been very, very valuable to me. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is something I mention every year. Uh, but and you know, it's a, this is like mathematicians' arrogance speaking for sure. But uh, you know, there's a certain truth to the idea that you know, if you did if you did epsilons and deltas, how hard could anything else be? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not entirely wrong. Um, uh, I mean, you know, of course, there's more complications when you deal with people. But yeah, so yes, thank, thank you very much for, for bringing that up. Uh, let me just mention, by the way, for everybody, uh, for everybody uh, who's, who's attending, uh, if you have questions, uh, please ask them on the chat. And I am mon and I'm monitoring the chat right now. I'm surprised to see nobody's asked any questions yet. But so you can go ahead and ask them now before you forget them. And uh, we'll sort of give you a chance to ask them, uh, ask them out loud later. Anyway, uh, so uh, next up is uh, Jeff Lee. Okay, let me unmute myself. Um, let's see, um, feel free to stop me or um, remind me if I miss any points. I'll start with my degree. Um, I did statistics because I wanted to work in industry. I wasn't quite concrete on what industry was applicable for math because math was like very um, abstract and um, it could be applied to all these different places. But I will tell you um, in my studies, uh, I did take some proof classes, two of them with Dr. Shu. Um, and what I will say is if you sit, if you sat in any of these proof classes, it doesn't necessarily have to be with Dr. Shu, but any proof you classes, you come out of it and you either decide you want to finish a degree or you do something else. And if you're still here, you're probably finishing the degree and <laughs> you may or may not have the mindset of a problem solver. Um, so the thing that helped me from this degree, um, and I'll talk about, I think, two main things. One is, and I'll, I'll go into that confidence that um, Siddhartha talked about a few minutes ago. Um, what confidence does uh, practically um, is being unafraid to ask questions and following up. So like, again, if you sat in any of these classes, if you don't ask questions, you either already, you don't, you've, you've already passed a class or you're gonna fail, right? Um, so you learn to ask the right questions. Like I think the hardest part of anything, um, and this not just school, it's in work too, because uh, honestly, none of what I use at work, I learned from school. Like it's mostly so, but I, what I can say is I learned how to ask questions. If I don't understand something, if I don't know what the assumptions are, um, even with a statistical model um, or just whatever process it is, if I don't understand something, you learn to identify it and you're like, hey, I don't get this thing. What's going on here? What are the underlying assumptions here? Why are we using this? So that's the first thing. Um, just being able to ask questions and doesn't even have to be about work. It could be about networking. Like, Hey, can you tell me about your job? Hey, you do this work here. Tell me more about this. And then you follow up. Like I, um, I don't know about this uh, cohort, but when I was going through school, um, again, back to the confidence thing, no one asked questions. I think I was one of the only two, three people that asked questions. Um, so start, Start asking questions. You'll figure out what kind of questions work for you, right? Um, build that confidence up. Get your get your butt whooped by some proofs, right? Um, yeah. So one thing is the confidence to ask questions. And the second thing is um, this is more personal, so it might be different for you guys. I networked a lot. Um, some people that I know like applied for hundreds and thousands of jobs. I applied for maybe less than forty. Um, maybe even like 35 or 30 or something like that. But I networked a lot. Like every semester I would go to like 15 plus events. Um, some at Berkeley, some in San Francisco. Um, and this is like after school or after part-time job after school. Um, and it would be long days of just grinding and like meeting people, shaking hands and again, asking people what they do. Um, but this is this is up to you, like whatever works for you. If you're the type to go meet people and say, hey, how are you doing? Shake their hands, right? Get their contact information and stuff like that, then cool. If you're one of those people like my friends who apply thousands of you know jobs and still get to work at Google, right? Then, then do that too. Um, let's see. So things that helped um, me from school is other than those two, um, it would be the time not like since I'm at school, I didn't spend time to go to work. I had the time to go network. I had the time to um, Google, like, uh, you know, what does an actuary do? Be an actuary.org, right? Like, what does it take to become one? Um, yeah. So 
how does the degree reflect in my day-to-day -day basis? Again, it's just, if I get confused, I ask the questions, I try to learn what the assumptions are, you know, like the onion layering of a proof, right? Like you gotta get from point A to point B. Um, there, is a, there is a lot of truth to what Dr. Shu said about if you can do your deltas and epsilons, like what else can you, like what can you not do, right? If, if you can get from point A, step by step by step by step to point B, then all you gotta do is change your point A and change your point B and you take one step at a time and that's how you get there. Um, what I think was hard for me was I didn't understand the value of, like, okay, so for me, when I was going to school, it was just, okay, do homework, finish, that's it. Um, it wasn't until later that, like, it hit me. Someone, someone told me their biggest regret, so I'll tell you this right now, is um, their biggest regret is not networking. And again, you'll, you you probably tell by now I'm a big networking guy. Is like you have if you have the time to go meet people, then do it, right? And if, um, ask them about work, ask them what they like, what they don't like, um, and stuff like that. How did I get my current job? Um, I got my current job by, uh, let's see. So again, with the networking, I went to an event late because I had a MS a statistics presentation to do. And I was an hour and a half late to this, this networking thing. So everyone, you know, you know, you, you open a door and everyone just looks at you like, who's this guy coming in late? But at that point, I had a few friends already. So a friend of a friend heard from someone in that room that they were hiring an intern. Okay. And I would not have known this if I didn't know these people already. So my friend's friend told my friend who told me after the whole thing ended. And then I went up to that random guy who currently is my boss, right? <laughs> and you just go up. Yeah, you never know. Like a friend of a friend, like who knew? I shook his hand and, you know, just tell me about, like, you don't have to ask any specific questions. Just tell me about the position or tell me about your work or tell me about fill in a blank. Just tell me about, and you just go from there. Um, that's how I got my job. And I interned there uh, 2018 and I am now an actuarial analyst. Um, yeah, uh, no math, mostly Excel. There is SQL, um, <laughs> and SAS, um, nothing you can't handle if you haven't already taken a beginning programming class and then Google will do the rest for you if you get stuck. Um, yeah. Oh, and have you taken the exams? So, I was oh, about good. to ask that. I have taken two exams. <clears throat> so, um, I guess the expect, okay, so, so real quick, the expectation for uh, any entry level slash internship is at least one exam. Um, that you should have one done or taken or, or tried? Done, done. Um, but, but what I will say is like, I've applied, okay, so before I got this job, I had an internship, but before I got that internship, people literally, like the person that I ended up working for literally told me, hey, Jeff, we're specifically looking for Berkeley students. We're San Jose State, so I'm not a Berkeley student. Specifically, literally told me into my face, like we're looking for, you know, like we're, cause this is at a Berkeley event. Again, I mentioned networking, go to network. But I'm like, I told him back to his face. I'm like, you know what? I understand that, but I'm gonna apply anyway. And guess what? Like I ended up working with him. Like, so even if it's like the one exam and it looks really scary, apply anyway i'll say this to any position apply anyway like they're, if they don't get back to you fine at least you applied right but yeah i did have exams by the time i got my first internship i had one exam and then i was studying for a second one and i passed that i think i still am at two exams because studying while working is a different beast i'll tell you that yeah and do you have to keep taking them to, 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 as part of your job or? Uh... Uh, yeah, the, the expectation, so there's two levels of credential. There's associateship and then there's fellowship. Associateship generally is about seven exams. Fellowship is 10 exams. Um, uh, there are people, a lot of people just stop at associateship, um, but the end of the road would be fellowship. It depends on how high on the food chain, I guess you wanna go. Um, 
I am at a company that is most, so a lot of private companies will have more pressure to take one exam a year, to pass one exam a year. Um, I work at a company that is more, uh, I guess more, more, I, I don't know, I don't want to use the word liberal. They're not as, there's not as much pressure to do that uh, where I'm at. So it just depends on who you work for. Um, and by the way, I, I don't make bank. I work for a government company. <laughs> so, and you can see, if you, if you know my name, you can find my salary online. It's not that, it's, it's, it's publicly available. So in case you're wondering, um, it's not all gold and bank for actuarial work. Well, I have to say these days, if, if you're, if you're still working from home. Yes, exactly. Count that's yourself what, that's, lucky. Yeah. No, that's the thing. Like, there's, it just depends, right? Like I, I'm looking for job security and I'm looking for um, work-life balance. And if I have that, then cool, right? Just again, uh, depends on your flavor. And this is my flavor. I network a ton and I like job security. Okay, great. And I have that. Thanks, Jeff. So next up is Amit. All right. I'm the best dressed of all of us for sure. <laughs> I have, I have I, been continuing. I'm to wearing a up. clean t-shirt today. This is my achievement. <laughs> nice. So my, uh, once again, my, I got my uh, BA, uh, BA in mathematics. And so I had uh, some of the proofs classes. I can't remember if I took abstract algebra with you, Professor Shu, but uh, that was definitely one of the harder, Whatever hardest, <laughs> one of the hardest classes I ever took. Yes. Uh, and so my trajectory was probably the least uh, traditional. So speaking of how I got my first job, uh, I actually, I think if I'm remembering correctly, there was a career fair or it was uh, a uh, leadership, uh, retail management position, a management position actually through Target. But one of the ways that really helped me get that was I was involved. I helped organize. Um, back then, it was uh, what was called the Smart Project and then Sustainability Week. So I was very active on campus with non-math related stuff. And so speaking of internships or speaking of ways that you can find um, how to stand out these are ways that you can take upon your own initiative. Cause I remember actually in that interview, they asked me, is like, uh, Oh, so you did, you did these projects. Like w what were those for? And it's like, they weren't for any class. I, I did them cause I was interested in the topic and whatnot. So that was actually a big significant factor in how I got my first job. And then even since then, you know, after that I went back to grad school um, I got my master's in public administration at San Francisco State University. And I remember actually the administrator said that I was the first ever math major accepted into the program for a hey. master's in public administration. Um, but it did definitely help me with some of the statistics, statistics classes and analysis. Um, and then even once I got into um, the Environmental Protection Agency, once again, not doing formal mathematical work, but the, um, the, the analytical thinking, the critical thinking definitely coming into play, seeing how, um, how I could really apply those concepts to certain things that I was dealing with. Definitely got very comfortable with uh, Excel spreadsheets. Uh, mathematical modeling was one of the classes that I took at, um, at San Jose State. And that really helped a lot with just I found a lot of stuff that I would do, even though it wasn't part of my job description, I was either putting together spreadsheets to either manage the workload or the data or compile stuff so that it's presentable. And uh, I found that really helped um, me be able to sort of shine in addition to the work that I had to do. Uh, and then as, as I went on, I then also had gotten uh, Lean Six Sigma certified while I was still at the EPA. And then with a lot of the Six Sigma work, the black belt work, there's a lot of statistics, a lot of 
uh, mathematical analytical um, work there that really came into play. But thinking in terms of, if I'm thinking sort of where folks might be now, it, um, actually I'd be curious if you um, are able to access the chat, like are you close to graduating? Where are you in your journey? And then I might even be able to customize some of my responses here. But some of the key aspects that I think, especially in uncertain times like right now, um, I've, I've always been one to say like, you can just do like the traditional path, like, okay, apply for jobs, do this, do that. But in today's world, things are shifting. It's going to be really hard to stand out now. Okay. So maybe you haven't, uh, maybe you're about to graduate and you haven't had the opportunity to uh, apply for an internship or whatnot. Then what I would propose is see how you can both go down the formal route of, okay, applying to roles, applying to jobs, but then also, as Jeff was saying, what are groups, what are ways that you could reach out to connect with people, to even ask for informational interviews? One of the best ways, as a college student, you have a very easy way to talk to people in the industry to say, hey, I'm a student at San Jose State, I'm a, you know, this major, I'd love to learn more about your industry, could I, you know, um, could I ask you for 15 minutes of your time um, just to ask you a few questions, you know? People are more willing to talk to you if you say, I'm a college student and I'm looking to learn more about your industry. Or if there's roles on LinkedIn that you're interested in. Hey, I'd really love to learn more about this role. Could I ask you a few questions? There's a few questions you can really simply ask them. It's like, you know, how did you get involved with X role? You know, what do you love about your role? What do you not like about your role? You know, and that's straight from, uh, I think from, you know, uh, parachute book, I'm blanking on the full, uh, what's the color of your parachute? So right. being able to not only develop your skills mathematically, yes, absolutely. That's like a baseline factor, right? That's a baseline factor. You want to develop your skills, but all the non-specific mathematical aspects are what has helped me um, in all the roles I've got, you know, at the EPA, uh, my interest with coaching and doing leadership coaching, that was stuff that I just continued to explore and learn on my own. So if there is a particular topic that you find yourself really driven and passionate, start creating a portfolio about it because that'll help you stand out between, you know, if 20 people are applying for a job, they all have the exact same sort of like, I did school, I did this, I did this, but here's this other aspect of, oh, I shipped a project, I was able to develop this, I coordinated with whatever. This is where I think there's a, a lot of creative opportunity to say, okay, in these times, um, maybe if companies are not hiring or there's hiring freeze, how can you start building effectively like your portfolio or your brand? And so that can come from, it doesn't have to be just um, mathematics because Professor Shu, you did, I think you, you also majored in music, right? That was That's a, right. Another, yeah. So find ways to, to really stand out because a lot of the things um, that um, Jeff kept pointing out about networking, it's actually about connecting to the person as who they are. So if, you love music and you find out that somebody in a company or a department or someone that you're interested in also loves music, actually being able to connect on that point is actually playing to your advantage. So those are some of the elements that I would really highlight to say, how can you just actually start connecting to other people as humans, not just, I'm a math major, what's my math career, what's my math job I can get? Yes, that's important, absolutely. But the more and more, you know, you know, Aaron talked about it, the industry is changing, the things are changing, and a big part of being able to really build those relationships in areas that, that you're interested in and overlap it with what you know can be incredibly powerful. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and look, just to, to uh, reinforce something that you, that you just said, uh, and sort of your entire life story, I mean, actually, everybody, uh, everybody has sort of mentioned some story like this. Um, uh, so you may have, you may have noticed either in the initial 
either in the initial uh, slide or in what the, what every story that everybody's given, that no one has the title of uh, uh, a mathematician, not even applied mathematician. And so uh, at, at almost everybody who gets a career out of, out of a math stats degree will be getting a, a career in something else. Uh, and so one thing that really helps that, I, that I've seen in people who are, are, are alums who are most successful is that they have some other interest, whether it be uh, whether it be programming. Is if you happen to be interested in programming, that's very good. Or you know, or or, uh, or data science or, or, or artificial intelligence. Or if you're really interested in, in succeeding in business, uh, or uh, as, as Aaron has has always been, uh, or uh, being an actuary, or uh, 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 in or uh, actually it, even if it doesn't necessarily sound like a uh, like a uh, such so, so like a so this is a career prospect like um it's it has always been interested in uh in uh, the environment and having sort of responsible business um uh and th that's sort of that's sort of how you've made your career that's that, that's a fair statement of it yeah absolutely absolutely yeah oh, wait, I, I meant to ask you uh so i i saw you you well you have your own company now can you say just a bit about how that how you did that because that's not an easy thing to start <laughs> your own company uh very very stumbling my way through it um so entrepreneurship, whether you're ever interested in, in starting your own company, I think, especially in Silicon Valley, it's very glamorized and, you know, it is, it is challenging to run your own business because one of the classic things, once you start seeing, um, you know, whether you, you are a statistician or you have your technical side, the moment you get into the business side of it, you're no longer just doing the technical work, especially if you're launching your own business. It, you have to learn the skills or some baseline of the actual, the management of a company and marketing and finding clients. And that's a whole other world. And I'm happy to, to share that with anybody that wants to know more. But I, you know, speaking of continuing to ed educate myself, like I, started following um you know bloggers and entrepreneurs and those who you know really seem to be prominent in the space and i actually signed up for like i went through a program to help me learn to build and develop my own business um and i was actually doing that while still at um, the epa and so there is ways even if let's say you take a job that you you know there's an opportunity that comes up and between something that's ideal and something that oh okay i you know there's an opportunity then it's okay to do that and then continue to be building this other thing and that's exactly what i did where i was at the epa but then you know in my free time i was you know learning about this and then um and then you know slowly came to a point where i felt comfortable enough to to launch the business very cool. And uh, can I jump in and ask, uh, answer that question by Jennifer Liu? Sure. So just is... my perspective uh, on a master's job. I'm telling you right now, when you get a master's job, you're looking at a higher paid table on average of $10,000 more or a year because I had to do compensation payment tables for companies. Erin, if I could just interrupt just my briefly. Life. Sorry, uh, I, I think uh, the, the YouTube video doesn't capture the chat. So, uh, so the Jennifer's oh, oh, question oh, okay. was, so how, the, important, how important is a mas getting a master's for tech or finance job? So go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So from an HR perspective, when you have a master's degree as part of your education background or a requirement for a job, your annual compensation or equivalent hourly pay will increase about on average $10,000 more a year, depending on the size and the industry saturation at that time. So for me, I noticed a huge jump in pay where I was struggling to, this is back in 2008, mind you. So I was struggling to get around $80,000 uh, starting pay with just a bachelor's. I, I took some time away from school because I was trained. <laughs> and so I took, I took a time out of sabbatical and then I went back for my master's. And as soon as I was done with my master's, I was making easy six figures or more, and it was easier to justify that when actually haggling. So when you do get, when you get to the point where you get to the negotiation table, understand, guarantee you most companies, they're not going to give you everything that they could on the first thing. Guarantee you, and that's because I've been on the other side of the table, <laughs> um, offering packages to people. 
but I will tell you this. Do the research on the job. Be confident on your experience, your skill set, your credentials, and you, you literally have more negotiation power than you think. Okay, Get that math. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Uh, so, uh, uh, one thing, I, uh, if uh, Judy is ready, uh, so a bunch of people were talking about, uh, were talking about uh, 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 networking, and obviously right now there are some challenges in networking, yes. so if you want to talk about what, uh, what has replaced, if anything, the, the, the career fairs, and like, you know, where, where is there, Ken, that, that's, as I think all of our speakers so far, where, where can you go to somebody in the industry and say, like, I'm really interested in your industry, can I have 15 minutes of your time? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question right now, um, as we're still kind of freshly getting involved in this whole crisis. Um, but I, gosh, um, the Career Center, we've been really encouraging people to network for a really long time. And I think now is, presents some opportunities that um, a lot of students and people in general haven't really thought about. So one of the first things that I recommend is We've talked about LinkedIn a few times today. So one of the things that I recommend students do is look for alumni in LinkedIn with their degree, with their major, and you will be probably astonished what you find in terms of what graduates are doing in your, in your major. So, um, and the beauty of LinkedIn is you can connect with people by saying you're a Spartan, you know, I mean, and, you know, not everybody is going to respond necessarily. I mean, the thing about LinkedIn is, um, I mean, I encourage students to reach out and pretty much um, to your point, a couple of you mentioned this, look through LinkedIn, find people with your degree and see what they're doing and you're gonna find all kinds of interesting things and then if you see companies that they're working for that really interest you or a role that they're working in reach out to that person and say i'm going to be graduating from san jose state this spring or next year i'm looking for an internship i'm gonna be looking for a job i'm really interested in what you do and getting back to setting up informational interviewing i think that's one way of doing that but ask for advice and you might be surprised how many people will respond and say, yeah, you can, you know, send me your resume or this is what I would do or I can refer you to someone, you know, what have you. So, um, so I think right now I'm, I'm figuring this is going to be a really good time to take advantage of LinkedIn. Um, a lot of people have not been doing that, including regular employees. Um, but I think right now it's important to reach out to your network and grow your network. And I talk to a lot of students who are just getting their LinkedIn profile going and they have just a handful of connections, very few. And so I also think this is a really good time to build that network and start reaching out to classmates, instructors, friends, graduates, anybody you can think of and, and build that network because any one of those people may be the one that tells you about a job opportunity um, that you would never have heard about any other way. And it can happen. And then the other thing on networking, um, getting back to what Jeff was talking about, was right now I look at things like Eventbrite and meetups and a number these two areas I'm seeing um, groups that are that are now quickly trying to change from live to virtual. And I think it's still happening, but I look at to see what events are going on. And in terms of passing information on to students, I look for events that are free or relatively inexpensive. But I'm seeing for my own self as a counselor, I'm seeing events coming up that are free that wouldn't normally be free, at least for now. Conferences, um, other workshops that um, I wouldn't even normally be able to attend otherwise. I might not be able to afford to attend. So that's what I'm looking at. And then I'm looking to see what's going on on campus or at least what the College of Science and what other colleges are, are publicizing right now. And I think they're all trying to come up with ways of getting information out to students. 
and the same with student orgs. So another networking method I think is, I recommend students join student orgs, student clubs. Um, and I think again, right now, some of them are gonna really take that step to reach out on a virtual level, get students to join, have events like your, this event right now. Um, so I think there are gonna be opportunities that are in the process of happening right now that would be well worth students looking into. Can I add to that? Um, uh, so, um, so back to the whole like knowing what questions to ask and networking, like I literally didn't think about Googling actuarial club until I was like in my junior year of college. And then I Googled actuarial club Bay Area and oh, I found like an entire group of professional like people. <laughs> There's literally a, an organization called Casualty Actuaries of the Bay Area and just stuff like that. And then like, you know, don't be afraid to Google like, hey, is, I wanna be a data scientist. Is, a there, is there a data science conference? Yes, there is. There's a thing called Women in Data Science, by the way. It was supposed to happen in March, but I think this COVID thing probably blew it all away. But just like, yeah, um, like uh, like Judy said, right? Like, look up like organizations, groups, memberships, um, clubs. It doesn't have to be San Jose State. It could be other schools too. Like, I think San Jose State. I think the hardest thing about being at San Jose State for networking is that it's a commuter school, so people just come and go. Like, people don't stay, um, so it's hard to make a club. Um, but if you can do it, then do it. But if you can't make a club, then find another club that's not necessarily at San Jose State, maybe at Berkeley, you know, maybe at Santa Clara, something. Um, but they exist. Uh, so start, start looking. All right. Now, finally, Val has been very patient. So uh, Val, uh, you, you, please come on, come on up and tell your story. Did you did you just unmute me or was that uh <laughs> well i can hear you now so you, oh uh... whoops oh shoot i hope that my keyboard wasn't too loud then I was... no no no, that's okay I'm i didn't so hear it sorry. i i thought i was on mute um okay uh <laughs> i think you know i a lot of um a lot of the folks on here have kind of already you know uh, touched on a lot of important points. Um, I guess just to kind of to give you guys a little bit of background on myself. Um, I got a uh, applied math degree from uh, UC San Diego, um, graduated in 2008. Uh, then um, I'm originally from the Bay Area, so decided to come back to San Jose State for grad school um, and got my master's uh, right after in, in math with an emphasis in applied math. Um, partly because one, I had no idea what the hell I wanted to do uh, after I graduated. <laughs> and, um, you know, two also because I just genuinely really enjoyed, um, you know, studying math. Um, I had a really great time um, when I was, uh, going through my bachelor's degree, I think partly um, because of just the environment that I was in. I was kind of lucky enough during my undergrad to actually have like a really great, um, like it was a really unique experience because I actually had a really close knit group of female um, math majors who I worked, uh, you know, alongside with and studied with and they all actually went to go get their PhDs and I was the only one who got my master's. <laughs> so just a really great group of inspirational women. Um, so that's, you know, uh, partly what inspired me to, to go get my math degree uh, or my grad, my graduate degree. Um, right after I graduated, I actually ended up working um, as um, a avi what is it, an aviation environmental analyst, which by the way, I actually got that job through networking, through Dr. Shu, through uh, a former career panelist. Um, I think maybe Erin may know her, Catherine Shelley, um, which, you know, it, it ended up being like a really great opportunity. Um, uh, you know, and so ended up working there for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, 
my degree definitely helped me a lot, um, mostly because uh, a lot of the work was analyst work, a lot of working with Excel, um, and I actually ended up learning how to code uh, from there in C Sharp. I actually did some coding, you know, while I was um, study, like while I was getting my degree. So I had some experience um, with MATLAB and C uh, from just, you know, studies, but, uh, oh, and I, yeah, CAMCOS too, I forgot. Jeff, Jeff just reminded me, I did that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so that kind of actually really, uh, so that, that helped a lot. Um, and Aaron definitely really touched on something in terms of having your master's degree and your, your pay scale. Um, you know, where I was working at the time, they were government contractors. So, you know, having that graduate degree already automatically bumps you up, um, you know, for where your starting salary is. So that was, so that's uh, definitely something. Um, so now actually this is kind of funny because this is where my, my career path actually kind of takes a really interesting turn. Um, I was, I ended up realizing that I really, was really bored. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, there's probably kind of like a stigma attached to um, government work, which I know that Jeff kind of already touched on. Um, and of course, you know, it, it's, it's different priorities for everyone. Um, I personally, um, you know, it was, it was not for me. It, so I, you know, decided that I, I wanted to do something else. Um, and at the time, I kind of I realized that I was actually really enjoying um, software and, and building tools, and um, had a really great opportunity to, to you know to learn like a new programming language while I was working, and um, decided that I wanted to go into software. Um, and so I actually ended up doing a boot camp. Um, so for those of you guys who like one of these uh, things you see on the subway? Huh? Yeah. No, like these ads on the subway. The many ads that you see, you know, you'll get like a bazillion, <laughs> yeah. like a bazillion ads. Um, no, I, they, I ended up going to one that was um, a bit more, like a bit more reputable. I <laughs> um, no offense. Uh, I, it, it definitely was not an easy decision for me. Um, but I definitely, I did do a lot of research and actually, you know, in, in the Bay Area, it's kind of, it's What's the it's name of your funny, boot camp? It's, you'll actually learn that a lot of people who are in the tech industry have actually gone in there through non-traditional means and boot camps are definitely one of them. But what's, what's, what's the name of your boot camp? Um, so the one that I went to was called App Academy. Um, it's in San Francisco. I'll, I'll look it up, and, don't worry. It's a web development boot camp, um, and uh, uh, oh. yeah. sorry, Cor I see I see Corey's question. Um, <laughs> uh, should I answer that now or should I just finish? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, Go finish. Go okay, yeah. So went to a boot camp. Um, and ended up finishing that. Took about three months. Really intense work. Um, you know, the programming experience definitely helped a lot, it helped me because I, so I was ahead a bit, but it definitely was not easy. Um, and then was able to get a job uh, shortly after that. At, and right now, funny enough, I am at a startup that builds it, that's a specific, that specifically builds a data privacy p platform. Oh. <laughs> um, so it's just funny that Siddharth is in Google ads. Um, <laughs> really contrast there. <laughs> All right, so the two of you are like spy versus spy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you guys have uh, been reading any news lately, data privacy is definitely um, a really hot topic right now, especially with, with where we're at right now. Um, uh, yeah, um, so uh, I think I saw Corey ask a couple of questions. Uh, Cor um, Corey, do you want to ask your questions out loud so for YouTube or do you, uh, you prefer that we read them to, for you? Can I read them? 
Um, let me let me see if Corey wants to be. Uh, Corey, I'm going to try to unmute you if you want to ask your question out loud. I am not succeeding in unmuting. Okay, so I will read Corey's question. Okay. Uh, so uh, Corey said, asked, hi Val, I was curious about the facial piercing. I also have a septum piercing, but it's one that I easily hide for work. Have people been accepting of it in the workforce? I'd love to be able to work in an environment where I can be comfortable wearing it, and but I could easily continue to hide it if needed. Um, yeah, so my septum piercing actually is not uh, hideable. I cannot hide it, it's just a ring. Um, and luckily, I think in the tech industry, um, depending on the type of company that you're working for, they are, I, I've experienced that they are very accepting of, uh, of this, um, you know, no, at least no one in my current company gives a crap about, um, what, what would know, they have but, thought of the FAA? Sorry. Uh, yeah. But yes, I will have to say that in my previous job, that was, you know, specifically um, a government contract, that was a government contractor, I would say that definitely was not the case. Um, you know, your appearance definitely uh, does matter. And also, I think in more like um, for financial in institutions, I think that's also the same way. Um, you know, I think, uh, so it, yeah, I think so Catherine really, used to talk really about <laughs> Catherine used to talk about there's there like an East Coast West Coast divide. Yes, there there definitely is. Um, <laughs> I think here business casual is uh, you know definitely very different than business casual over on the East Coast. Um, let's just say. I mean, especially, you know, coming from a startup, uh, there, I don't really think that there's anything, such thing as business casual um, for my company. <laughs> um, uh, I've worn shorts to work uh, <laughs> before, and it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, uh, I think it really, it really depends on, on the company. Um, from my experience, um, most, uh, you know, SaaS companies don't really care too much or at least everyone that I've interacted with um you know I've gone to conferences and there have been many people with piercings tattoos that are very visible different colored hair um you know it it really I yeah I I personally haven't experienced um any anyone who isn't accepting of it but again it it really depends um. And, and Amit adds, uh, do your homework about the work culture and yeah. if, that, that, if that fits you. Yeah, Sounds like good exactly. advice. Mm -hmm. And so the second question, maybe, for, maybe this is a question for everybody, because um, I think I guess we're now sort of in the question time. Uh, how long did it take you to get up to speed on coding? That's just Corey's other question. Oh, um, let's see. I think that's actually, that's, it's kind of difficult to answer because um, I felt like I started learning um, while I was getting my degree, um, purely just for, uh, just to get by with academic, you know, my academics and 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 get do homework. Um, so I think that really just built a foundation from there. I would say, you know, um, learning the basics you can kind of learn as you go. Um, so I, I, I don't think that. Uh, Let's see. Um, so in terms of getting up to speed, um, it really is more like once you learn one language and you learn the basics of one language, it's really easy to pick up another one because for the most part, they're, the, uh, the basics are, very, are pretty similar. It's just the syntax that's different. Um, that's my experience. Uh, maybe Siddharth could, could comment if he, if he has an opinion or anyone else. <laughs> That's a good uh, yes. question for the guy at Google. Yes, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a very interesting uh, account. Uh, so when I decided to uh, apply to the industry, um, uh, I first applied to financial institutions in New York. And while I was doing that, my wife uh, said that, you know, I'm not very uh, comfortable going to New York. So why don't you try and apply to software industries? And as I said, I had absolutely all close to zero experience in coding. 
So, uh, but, but being very, very confident, I thought, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, can just, uh, I can just still apply. So initially I applied to one uh, company in LA, local company. And at that time I didn't know any coding. I was called for the interview. I went there and they asked me a simple program and I said, okay, you just do this. And then you have, uh, you iterate through this thing and then you will get some result and then you output that, right? And they said, okay, write the code. I said, I just told you what the code is. He said, no, 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 write the, <laughs> write the code. So I said, okay. And then I go up to the board and I say, okay, if this happens, then you do this. And then he's saying, what language is this? I said, English. What do you mean? <laughs> so, so, so this was my situation. And then I came back home and uh, my wife says, my wife uh, was working in the software industry at the time. So she's saying, uh, how did the interview go? I said, great. Uh, and she said, what did they ask you? I said, they asked me this. And uh, what did you say? I said, I said this. And he said, okay, you're not getting the offer. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. And then, so then I find out, okay, okay, this is, you really have to code. You have to know a language and code that. And so, and, but I have no experience and I want to apply to the companies and they want to see what you have done. What is your experience? So my uh, approach was this. I applied to four companies in LA, four startups. And they, the uh, mode at that time was that if you apply to a startup, they give you a coding project. And then you complete the coding project and submit it over the weekend. And then they tell you whether you did well or not. Okay. And one, my strategy was that I'm going to apply to five or four or five companies. I'm going to do the coding project that they assigned to me. And I'm going to report that as my experience <laughs> uh, to, apply, to apply to the other companies. So I really wanted to apply to LinkedIn and Google. And so I applied to four companies in LA. Then they gave me a coding project. Then I had my books and everything. I could look it up and uh, finish the coding project. Uh, and once I did that, I put it on my resume that, okay, this is my experience. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And then um, um, Google uh, gave me a call for a telephone interview. Uh, and that I scheduled it as far back as I could, which was like, I think one and a half months, five weeks or something. And I scheduled that and I caught up on my coding. And then I had a telephone interview uh, in which they don't really ask you serious coding, but uh, problem solving mostly. Mm. Uh, and after that, I again took my time five weeks after that. And then they scheduled the onsite. And by that time, I was reasonably well prepared. So to, ask, to answer your question. So it took you about 10 weeks. 10 weeks plus, I would say, a few weekends where I did the uh, uh, projects. For the for the startups, yeah, I think that would be fair. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I, I so think who posted, I, Aaron, did you talk about posting your stuff on GitHub? Yeah. Uh, so anyone that does a project, if you're able to codify it, as they say, because people will take your code and test it, uh, put your data set up there. Make sure it's anonymized data. It's nothing that's going to get you in trouble and write a story of what you were trying to teach yourself or to maybe show a different perspective on uh, an analytical view. Put it on GitHub. Put it in, well, in my industry, I see a lot of SQL and Python. I don't see C anymore from where I am, but it's a different industry and the companies that I'm working for are using newer technologies. Whereas if you're in other industries, they might be using COBOL. <laughs> but <laughs> COBOL is a hot new language, right? <laughs> no, it is, right? Because but I, I will say this. A, a lot of people don't realize that we're still using Excel. I am working at large global companies, and we are still using Excel. And, I, and in my interview, I looked at the director at Salesforce, and I said, no company should be doing analyses like we were doing it 20 years ago. We are basically spitting on the technological advancements and all the knowledge that we are pushing to expand on. And so I said, the only reason I learned programming is because I wanted to learn to do something better because as we grow, we really need to scale our business processes with our growth. So we are basically forcing ourselves to open up our mind on how to do things better. Sure, I can do a math problem on a piece of paper. I can put it in Excel. That's great. But how can I do it better? So I've created a program in VBA where it would pull 500 plus reports in 16 hours. 
using VBA. And then I ended up doing a system implement implementation, which was SQL on the back end. And now I think I might be up for another one where it's SQL and Python. And I don't know anything about Python. And I guarantee you, I will be Googling and YouTubing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, are there any, I mean, we've had a couple of questions already, but uh, uh, we only have a few minutes, maybe just one minute. Um, um, are there any I other questions? To, sorry, Go Dr. Chi, I actually wanted to point out something. Um, something that I noticed about uh, the way Siddharth's story about, you know, about learning how to code. I kind of want to point out something that he said at the very beginning is that during his first interview, when he was asked to code, to code something and he immediately went into like an if else, right? I think that that's actually something that's really telling about, you know, the training that you get from, um, you know, uh, studying math or just like being able to problem solve in general. And I think that that's a really good baseline if, so you can, to where like, you know, you can learn because uh, that's kind of like where, you know, the building blocks of programming is, is like learning those logic gates and whatnot. And the fact that you can kind of already be able to think like that would make it is makes it much easier. Um, so I, I think that that's something that's definitely worth pointing out. Um, so, you know, there's the syntax, but then there's also the way that you have to learn how to think too. And so like, you know, for, so I think that that, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just kind of wanted to point that out. I thought that that was really. Yeah, it, uh, it's no accident that the first programmers were going back to Ada Lovelace, I guess. Mm -hmm. We're all mathematicians. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, so, uh, and so every, there, there are a bazillion, oh, oh, okay, question from Neil, here we go. Maybe this will, this will probably be our last question. So, uh, so Neil asks, all these different job titles are intimidating considering my major is applied math and a minor in physics. I'm taking astrophysics classes to go along with my major as well. Does that mean I should just be looking to just talk with aerospace companies? I feel as if I do not have that much variety. Everybody's saying no. Go ahead, Val. Um, no, I mean, I think, <sighs> let's just say this in general, right? Like we all just have math, you know, our degrees are, are in math right and so granted there are some people that have focuses but you know for me yeah i studied applied math but now i'm doing web development you know i think there these skills are just more that you that you learn are just are transferable um you're not necessarily you shouldn't really think that you should really stick to one lane you just kind of have to think about you know the skills that you have and where where else you can apply them. Um, yeah, sorry. Good. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, anybody else want to chime in on that? Yeah. Um, so let me just tell you, when I applied for actuarial science positions, um, I beyond be an actuary.org, I had no idea what the heck I was going to be doing day to day. Okay. Um, I'm still learning. I've been there for a year and a half. So um, in terms of like what you study and I mean, what looks like what Dr. Shu said, you, you don't expect a mathematician to be a mathematician in an industry. So what I will say is um, instead of focusing on what kind of industry you want, because there are so many different industries, um, you start focusing on little things like your problem sets or your projects, like actually put your effort into it because later on, whatever you apply to, they're going to ask you about your resume. Guess what's gonna be on your resume? Your projects your your educational experience and it's just like so don't worry about like what industry you want to work like if you're interested in, aer in aerodynamics or uh, astrophysics fine start looking into that but right now what you can do is you know again go learn about what kinds of work because you're not going to know what their day-to-day -day is without actually meeting someone in there right so kind of get an idea of what that industry smells like but then also be able to talk about your experiences because the astrophysicist that's going to interview you won't even know what you do unless you're serious about what you're doing. So instead of focusing on what direction, start like growing your own stuff right now. Cause like, I don't know about, again, I don't know about the current cohort, but like people don't take their homework seriously um, where I came from. Um, and like projects, people are just doing it to get a check off of the list somewhere. But then like two months down the road, they're not going to remember what projects they did. How are you going to be able to tell 
if I interview you, how am I, like, I'm going to ask you, like, what, what did you do? And oftentimes people are going to be like, I don't know. I just wanted to pass a class. It's like, no, start. So instead of, so the, I think the right question here would be, how can you prepare yourself for whatever astro, uh, aerodynamics, physics, actuarial science, like start by owning your own project. Like don't just pass it, but own it. And then passing it is just a side piece that comes with owning it. Um, so that's kind of a cop out, but that's just, I think that's how I wanted to answer you know that question. Mean, uh, you know, I think uh, I always like to say that the one, one of the great things about having a degree in the mathematical sciences, math or statistics, is you can kind of use that and, and do anything, go into any industry. And one of the downsides of having a degree in, in the mathematical sciences is that you can take that and go into anything in any industry. And so you have to decide what to do. There's not like an obvious slot that you have to go into. And so you have, kind of have to add that yourself, you know, put it, that you have to, as, as Amit did, find something that, he, that you're really interested in, like, 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 like Amit did with uh, in, uh, the environment, and sort of make that your, uh, sort of based what, where you look for jobs uh, and, uh, on, on your calling, of all things. Uh, so, and because I know that really helps. Um, and then if, yeah, and if you find out you're not interested, then ask that same question elsewhere, you know, tell me about whatever. And that truly is the benefit of doing the informational interviews because you can get a very quick sense of, oh yeah, my day-to-day -day work as this job title is X, Y, Z. And you may realize very quickly, oh God, I don't want to be anywhere near that type of work. And you <laughs> saved yourself, you know, a year's worth of work by talking to three people, right? And so that's one of the things I would really encourage and, and challenge, which a lot of the other panelists have said. Um, if you're really going to be resilient, Im improve your chances of making it in this very challenging times, it, it's going to be hard to do that if you only follow the traditional paths. I checked my box of a degree, and I'm checking boxes of applying to jobs. Yes, it may work, but if you want to increase your likeliness, you know, you got to, you got to get out and talk to people. Start with reaching out to us on this panel, right? You've got a warm, friendly audience here. Ask us. I'm happy to help you. And I imagine many of the others. And then particularly with the mindset of, you know, really see that you can gain the skills that you need to, right? I put in a, in the, the chat, if you have a San Jose library card or even a San Francisco uh, Lynda.com was acquired by LinkedIn Learning. You can get that for free if you use your library card. So any of the other technical things that you want to add to your portfolio, you can go out and find it. Uh, and speaking of the speaking I of the links. Being... Oh, go ahead. Well, Chris has a question here, and I get there might be a misconception where a uh, lot me, of that Let me reread Chris's thing. question. So uh, Chris yeah. asks, as a BA math major, what is the most important thing to do to get an industry besides coding slash programming? I'm going to be honest. I learned coding probably the last two years. Before that, I wouldn't say I was a yes person, but I was the kind of person where I wanted to be open to see what would be interested as far as a career. So I would take on projects, some of them I absolutely hate and wish I said no to. I'm going to be honest. And the others, I was absolutely happy that I took it, n not knowing where it was going to lead me, because it helped me be open to um, early on in my career versus later on, this is what I want to stay in, and versus just pigeonholing myself and not being open to new opportunities and projects. And by the way, if you look at me on LinkedIn, it literally looks like I jump ship every one to two years. And every time I go into an interview, I always have to have a conversation around what was the reasons of why I had shifted so many times. Part of it were layoffs. That's something that's going to happen in the tech industry, no matter where you go in high tech. The others, it all had to do with the fact that I'm not going to deal with a two hour one way commute. And you have to be honest in these conversations because people want to know that, okay, well, if I, if I invest in you and I take a leap of faith, I want to make sure that A, you check off all the boxes. And these were sound, reasonably justified decisions for me to make a change. So be open to change. If anyone questions your decisions, just 
be confident that you can stand on your own two feet and justify why you made the decisions that you did because you will be asked in an interview. And uh, actually, Judy, this, this is the sort of thing I, I'm sure you'd be up on. What's the average number of years that so many people stay at positions these days? I think it's probably like two years. One, you know, I, that's about right. I thought that's, that's about right. But if you do, you know, move on, give a, have, be ready to explain why. You know, just because um, it happens. And I think there are a lot of um, people that are doing that. They're seeing, um, I, I was just thinking about somebody that I know who, uh, we've done a number, we've done some other panels like this. And I was thinking of one of the graduates who um, has his degree in computer science, his bachelor's. And he, working for Google was his goal. He flat out didn't want to, you know, that was his focus. So evidently he applied and interviewed something like four or five times and did not get hired. And finally did it, applied again, interviewed, got hired. Ultimately he lasted at Google for about a year and a half and went to Robin Hood. And <laughs> what's, what's Robin Hood? Telling me it, no, it was, you haven't heard Robin Hood yet? No, I don't know Robin Hood. <laughs> Do you know what Robin Hood is? <laughs> you need to go check that out. Uh oh. That's just too funny. So hilarious. probably not the best time to. No, probably not. <laughs> but, but he said, he said, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, it says open to new opportunities. So he hasn't taken that off of his profile yet. So he said he's still open. <laughs> so there you go. So what's going to happen now with this whole thing with every, a lot of people getting laid off and, and what's happening, it's going to be an opportunity for a lot of people too. Yeah, who knew that working at Zoom would be so so up and coming? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd bought stuff. Ah. As we are all saying. <laughs> yes, as we're all saying. They're not doing very great in the privacy section right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, True. there's a lot of opportunity oh. to work on privacy for Zoom, I think. <laughs> yeah. We have a question here. Oh, uh, from, from Jazz. Uh, what skills, knowledge would help, help me get into a software slash programming role? I keep feeling that I'm not as well prepared as students in the CS major. I understand interviews are very technical and personal projects seem to be the norm. I've taken the beginning programming classes so far. Ooh, that's simple. Uh, Amit, would you agree that while this person's a student, get on lynda.com, take the tutorials. Some of those tutorials actually have tests. And when you finish it and you post it on LinkedIn, that you'll get a lot of hits for doing that. Yeah, definitely. This is once again, um, w one of the messages I would really like to push forward. And it, it's a thread a lot of the other panelists have said too, is like, um, you have the opportunity to start looking outside of just your traditional path and you can absolutely get creative and find opportunities. So the, the free resources from LinkedIn learning, you can take the things you can see it and add it as part of your resume of Sure, I was a this major, but I've also taken these courses. If you do a little project out of it, you know, you can add that to sort of your list of projects. So this, I would say, is going to be a lot more on the initiative that you take in above and beyond, because then that's also going to be directly relatable to someone hiring you to say, oh, this is a person who takes initiative. They're not just doing what they're told and supposed to do, they're looking beyond to see what could really contribute to my team or the department or whatnot. So the more you can demonstrate that now, or if you haven't been used to doing that, you have the opportunity to, to, to start building it now. And I think that can absolutely translate besides the, the, the very specific technical skills, but the broader skills. Okay, I, uh, that, I think that's not a bad place to end. Uh, so thank you very much every, uh, to our panelists. Uh, if, if you have more questions, uh, those, of you, uh, those of you who attended, or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please feel free uh, to, send, uh, to send me. I, I, I bother, every, if you're watching this on YouTube, I've probably bothered you with some sort of mass email within the last five hours. So yeah, you have my email address, if, anything, if nothing else. Um, and uh, let's thank, uh, thank our, uh, is there a little clappy button here or something? Let's thank our, thank our panelists again. <laughs> Everybody hit the clappy button. Yay, clappy, All right. clappy. All right, uh, or <laughs> you don't know what the clappy button is, that's fine. Um, so um, I will try to, I will try to uh, so I guess 
there's a there's a bazillion links in the chat. I will try to copy those into the into the uh, description for of the of the YouTube video and send those to everybody as well. And uh, and maybe there will be some other uh, sort of networking things that you can do. Anyway, uh, I'm I, you know I'm just really pleased that we got through an hour and a half without any kind of terrible Zoom bombing uh, incidents. So uh, so thanks everybody. Thanks for stopping by and thank uh, thank you our panelists again. And uh, and take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay indoors. Stay home. And we'll 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 be out of this soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.